All right, so today we're looking at Genesis chapter 1, the image of God. Uh, if you've got your Bible still open there, let's look at Genesis chapter 1 together. I have a lot of material to cover this morning. We'll do the best that we can. <laughs> Nervous, and all God's people laughed nervously. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, uh, we're going to be looking at just these few verses here together this morning. And um, then we'll, what I want to do is, as always, we'll spend a little bit of time here just with the text Make sure that we have understood it in context and really uh, what's here in these verses. Then we'll talk a little bit about the idea of being secure, safe, and sound, the theme of this series, and then we'll move to make some direct application uh, of it uh, together this morning. Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse number 26. I want to read just the first two verses uh, before we pray. You've already stood for the reading, so I want to ask you to stand again, but look with me, if you would, at Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse number 26. And God said, let us make man in our image. I don't know if you've thought about the incredible depth and importance of this phrase. But this is a life-changing, life-giving truth, if we will get a hold of it, that God has made people in his own image. God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for this portion of Scripture. We thank you, God, that you have not left it as a mystery for us where we came from. Lord, that we don't have to just go dig in the earth, that we don't have to speculate or wait on scientists to try to tell us about our origins, but that you have given us a testimony of our history. Lord, we know that we live in an age, particularly here in America, where it is increasingly unpopular to be a Christian, where especially as Christians who would believe what the Bible says, our culture is increasingly hostile towards Bible believers. Lord, you know that sometimes our hearts can even tremble a little bit at some of the, just the anger and the scorn that is directed towards those of us who would try to believe your book. God, we pray that you would just minister to our hearts, Father, that we would care more about your approval than we care about the approval of the world. Father, that we would have a little bit more of a burden for those lost sheep who are out there and God, a desire in our hearts to see them come in from the cold. Help us, Lord, as we study this this morning. God, I just, for myself, Lord, I never feel ready or like the right person. But if, you'll, if you'd use me, God, I'd like you to do that. These are your people. They've come to hear from you. God, our great and desperate need is to hear from you. We don't need just to add to our knowledge God, we need you, and we need you so badly. However it is that you'd like to speak to each and every one of us, God, give us ears to hear. We might might not miss you this morning. We want you to do something, God, that only you can do, and that is change us. Make us more like you, we pray. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Let's look together at the text a little bit this morning. Uh, If you'd like to follow along in your uh, bulletins this morning, you're welcome to do that. We would invite you to follow along and fill in some of those blanks and some of the scripture cross-references we'll look at are in there. Or, of course, you're welcome to uh, just listen as we go as well. We'll begin with the the text here, the first few verses, verses 26 through 28. 
Uh, we see here the pinnacle of God's creation. And it's sort of amazing to me nowadays that uh, even that is, can be a little bit of a politically incorrect statement to identify human beings as the pinnacle of God's creation. I want you to know that that's not entirely new. Uh, there, there was a day even when uh, Linnaeus, uh, the great scientist, was creating his or taxonomy of animals and dividing things into, into species, and somebody uh, was bugging him about that and said, well, why did you put human beings at the, at the top of the chart? And he says, well, if the dog makes a chart, he can put himself at the top of it. <laughs> And I kind of like that. But, but we see that there's something even more than that. It's not just because we're making the list that we put ourselves at the top. And it can kind of maybe seem a little uh, egocentric or something almost to say that human beings are the pinnacle of God's creation. But I want you to know this morning that that is not just ego talking. That's what the Bible says. The, the Bible separates mankind from the rest of creation and explicitly puts us at the top. And I want you to know that the more seriously you take that, the less of an ego trip that is, and the more of a sober responsibility that becomes. I remember before I was a pastor, uh, I would read, in, we were talking about this this morning in my, uh, in my Bible study class, <laughs> you read in Acts where 3,000 people get saved in one day. And you say, wow, isn't that incredible? 3,000 people saved and baptized and joined the church in one day. Wouldn't that be incredible if God were to do something like that today? And wouldn't you love that to happen at our church? And then you become a pastor and you think, that sounds terrible. What a nightmare. There's not enough Advil in Spokane County for 3,000 brand new Christians in one church. Now, that's just the exceedingly bad attitude your pastor has. <laughs> but it's different when you start to look at things from a point of view of responsibility. Oh, it got quiet in here all of a sudden. I'm just telling you that when it, when it's, it's, it's fine to be the boss man until you realize that means you're responsible. <laughs> So listen, the pinnacle of God's creation is human beings. And I want to say a couple of things about that. So verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Now you might notice again there that we're dealing with the plurals. And we talked about that four weeks ago when we began in Genesis. And we talked about how from the very first verse, from the first three verses in particular, we see that as God begins to reveal himself and reveal his nature and character to us, from the very first lines of the Bible, we see that we are are dealing with a triune God, with a God who is three but also one. And don't think too deeply about it. It's okay that God is a little bit beyond your ability to put into a nice, neat box. I would encourage you again, as I've encouraged you before, to be suspicious of any God that is too much like you. I am greatly comforted by the fact that the God that God, the true and living God, as he is presented to us in the scriptures, is not the kind of God that people would invent. He's a little bit beyond that, and I find that to be a wonderfully comforting thing. But God here says, let us make man in our image. And so we find here that the triune God is going to create a triune being. Part of, I believe this is true, that part of what it means to be in the image of God is that people are in a sense, not of course the way that God is, but in a way, we're triune beings also. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 is there in your outline. Let me, say what I, let me explain what I mean. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, some people will say, do you believe that people really have a soul? And I like to say, no, you are a soul, you have a body. You can steal that one if you like. I stole it from somebody too. You, you, you don't have a soul, you are a soul, but you have a body. But by the way, the Bible also says that you have a spirit also. And what are, what's the difference between your spirit, your spirit and your soul? The truthful answer is, I am not really sure. I know that's not a great answer. 
But the Bible, if you'll study it, which I have, you'll see that soul and spirit, those terms get used somewhat interchangeably in the Bible. Sometimes the soul seems to refer to this and sometimes the spirit seems to refer to that and it kind of wanders around and back and forth and up and down. And by the end of it, you will probably come out where I've come out and gone, Rrr. Not entirely sure. It seems that the soul has mostly to do with your personality, with what we think of as your personality, with your character, with, with who you are as a person. Uh, the spirit has, it seems, to more to do with our communication ability with God. It has to do more with the, the spiritual realm, if you will, the things that have to do with the spirit. Makes sense? But I wouldn't get too animated about any of those distinctions. How many of you know that what's going on in your body can affect your soul or your spirit? Anyone who's ever been angry because they were hungry knows exactly what I'm talking about. Something going on physically in your body can affect the way that your attitude, that your soul, that your spirit is responding. The same thing goes the other way. When you are like fasting and praying and going without food, but you're really depending on the spirit, you cannot care about the things that are going on in the body. People who can sing psalms and hymns and praises to God as they burn at the stake. It's a complicated relationship between the body and the soul and the spirit, which is one of the things that the Bible says about the Bible is that the Bible is such a sharp sword, it can even tell the difference between soul and spirit. But the triune God has created us in his image in, his, uh, in, a, in a different way, but in a reflection of God's way has made us three-part beings also. Secondly, we see that we are made in the image of God. Human beings were made in the image of God. Now, this is an entire sermon of itself, and we're going to develop it a little bit more as we get to the application part of the message this morning. But I want to say to you as clearly as I can this morning that there is something unbelievably special about you. We live in a day and an age where People are trying very hard to be special. Some of them do it in very destructive ways. A lot of what goes on in social media is so destructive and it's a desperate attempt to be special. So much of that is tragic because the way they try to be special is by copying what they see some other famous person doing. And in an effort to be special, they just become just like somebody else, trying to become like somebody else. Some, one of the common threads that motivates the people that shoot up schools is the desire to be special, to have people know who they are, to remember their name. Some people feel like they're not special at all. Somebody once said, if you're one in a million and you move to New York, there's 23 people just like you. And people get lost feeling like they're definitely not special. But if I could, from the Word of God, tell you this morning that there is something unbelievably special about you and it's got nothing to do with what other people see or what other people think or even with what you see or what you think. And it's this, that God made you in His image. I'd also like to say this this morning. We do not reflect God's image because of any specific attribute. Some people say, well, what is it that makes us humans? Is it speech? Is it our intelligence? Is it our creativity? Is it language? We're going to talk about some of those things this morning. But the answer is that those things do not make us in the image of God. It is because we are in the image of God that we have some of those things. And this is an, an, an essential point because what about people that are missing something or get damaged in some way or have had something terribly wrong go with them? If you, if you lose both arms, are you 20% less in the image of God? Your arms don't make you in the image of God. Your ability to speak doesn't make you in the image of God. A certain level IQ does not make you in the image of God.
my son has some things in common with me. <laughs> some of them are positive. <laughs> but it's not because he likes to talk that he is my son. He's my son. And because of that, <laughs> he likes to talk. <laughs> but you get the distinction there? Evangeline can only say about four words. And she is very much my kid. This likeness that we have of God, God said, let's make man in our image and after our likeness. It's a spiritual likeness that we have to God. It's not a physical likeness per se. It is a spiritual likeness. Although, in the sense that Christ became a man, Jesus Christ still to this day has his resurrection body, you, you, we are going to be able to grab his feet and shake his hand, amen, and see the nail marks in his hands and feet. Christ has a body like ours, and so in that sense, of course, we do have a body like God, but the sense here is a spiritual likeness. In John 4, 24, the Bible says this, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The likeness primarily that God has given us to him is not a physical likeness, which is part of the reason I believe there is such wonderful physical diversity. What a bummer it would be if everybody looked the same. How would you know who's supposed to feed you? <laughs> All right, you can take that for what it's worth. Okay, some of, you, some of you think that's funny. Those of you that do, you explain it to the people that didn't laugh later. Okay. But God is a spirit, and our primary likeness to him is, is a spiritual likeness. Let's also talk about, I got, oh yeah, there's, I put this picture in the wrong place. I was going to say, I thought I had a picture of Hugo, right? Any excuse to show a picture of my kid. We got a trampoline this week. We're super excited about it. Heather, Heather when we were buying it, she literally, and I was like, oh, you know, we need the trampoline, we need that. And she said, hamsters need wheels. <laughs> And she can say that about her son because she adores him, right? We, we adore. Anyway, so we got, we got the trampoline. But to my point, that face is a face I make. There's a picture I almost showed of it, but it's a little bit embarrassing, where Hugo and I are making the exact same face. But it's not because he makes that face that he's my son. Okay. I just thought, he's, you can't tell him this picture, but he's airborne right there. So I'm just saying the stomping and stuff comes naturally. Okay. It's a spiritual likeness. And then we also want to talk about dominion. Dominion is responsibility. I hinted this at already. Look at verse 28 there in our text, verse 28. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish, uh, which, well, let me just pause right here really quickly. I don't have time to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, Hebrew replenish there is mala, and it means to fill. It means to fill. There's been some confusion in Christian circles about what it means that God said to replenish the earth. Does that mean there were people before and there was some terror? And people have theorized all kinds of things about a pre-Adamite race and, and they're destroyed and a Luciferian flood and all this sort of stuff. And there's, you, if you, you can go down a rabbit hole on this if you want to. There's really no need for it. I advise against it. Replenish here, mala means to fill. That's what the Hebrew word means. It's used uh, almost a hundred times in the Old Testament. Almost always it's translated fill. Uh, that's what it means. Uh, if you wonder why is it translated replenish instead of fill here, in the 1600s when the King James was written, replenish meant fill. The English word replenish meant fill. You can go get an old dictionary. You'll see that that's true. Uh, an example of this is the word release. Release is the same. It comes from the same roots in English. Release doesn't mean to turn loose again. It means to turn them loose, to release, right? So replenish, release, the same thing. It just means to fill, it means to set free. Okay, so don't, all right. Whew. So God said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God gave dominion, authority over the earth to people. That's why, and we're going to get to the fall in a couple weeks. When we get to the fall, that's why when Adam and Eve sinned, everything suffered. I don't know if you've ever wondered, you know, animals get cancer and die. Trees can get diseases. We, we look up into space even, and we see stars dying and Things colliding into each other and breaking apart. 
everything in the whole universe is wearing out. Why does everything suffer? It's because we were placed in charge of it. And we broke it. You can Nate hit on that in the scripture reading. Because when you're in charge of something, you're responsible for it. And if you do a bad job, the people you're responsible for will suffer. I so appreciate Brother Nick. Here's brand new father. And he shared here from, from the pulpit even about how motivated he is to become more like his loving heavenly father so that he can be a loving father to his son. That's the attitude we ought to have about anybody we have responsibility for. Because when we're responsible for somebody, the decisions that you make are going to affect them. Listen, I'm just looking around the room here this morning. Most of you have had somebody that was responsible for you, a parent or somebody, that poured some hurt and brokenness into you. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. Listen, God gave us an enormous responsibility when he put us in charge of things. I don't, it makes me upset when I see people mistreating anything that God made. The, the Bible says a wise man has respect unto his beast, right? There, there is no call for hurting animals or for just wanton destruction of nature. Now listen, we, I know we live in an age where people have reversed things and they've put nature on the top of the pyramid and that's a terrible, we've preached on that already, the mistake of, of pantheism and, and that sort of thing. That, that's, that's wrong. Let me just be clear that that's wrong. But listen, it's not right for us either to just destroy things just because we're in charge. Luke 12, 48, Jesus said, For unto whomsoever much is given of him, much shall be required. We need to have a little bit of a sense of responsibility here for what's going on under our control. Say amen, I'll move on. Okay. Um, so God gave us dominion, and God also made us male and female from the beginning. Male and female, both in the image of God. I don't know why this is so hard for people. <laughs> Who was made in the image of God? Was Adam made in the image of God? Yes. How about Eve? Same thing. Okay, both in the image of God. Do you, do you all see that there in your Bibles? So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. I don't know if you know this, but women are people too. <laughs> I, I am serious about this. I, put, close your mouths. I, some people in Hollywood only figured this out a couple years ago. Like, do, can you believe that? It took until a couple years ago for some people in Hollywood to go, you know what? I think women are people. Some of them still don't believe it. Did you know that a lot of this hashtagging is covering up for the fact that so much of Hollywood has turned half of the human race into physical objects? Physical objects that have no value outside of their appearance. It's horrifying and disgusting. It makes me furious. They preen around because they've discovered that women are people. I don't know about you, but... My dad taught me that when I was little. Okay. <laughs> I thought, lighten it up just a little bit. I said, well, so God made, God made them both. That's true. Because, you know, God made Adam in the morning, of course. So when did he make the woman? In the eve. <laughs> ah, oh, don't boo me. I got that from Charlie Walker. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. So God made uh, men and women in his image. All right. Uh, Jesus, Mark 10, 6, by the way, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. From the beginning, that's how it was. Okay. And then we see in verse 29, 31, there's no death and that everything is very good. Everything is very good. Uh, look again with me, if you would, at verse 29. And God said, Behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. Uh, note here that the original plan was for everyone to be a vegetarian. 
Yeah, that was, that was the original plan. Yeah, Linda knows, right? Yeah. And that, the, the original plan was, hey, you want to eat something, go eat, eat your veggies. That was the plan. There's no death, not even for food. This is an important point. Animals were not being killed even for any reason. There was no death at the beginning and, and not, not for food either. Only plants, which of course plants are not alive the same way that people are, were to be eaten for food. Now, God specifically reverses this uh, after the flood. In Genesis 9-3, God specifically addresses this and says, okay, now you can eat meat. But I would just say, if I could, just quickly, I, I just as long as I'm hitting all the boxes here, it, it's not a good idea to overdo it on that. Eat your veggies, people. All right, moving on. Verse 30. And to every beast of the earth and every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life, I've given every green herb for meat. And it was so. Everything were, all the animals were plant eaters to start with. Dinosaurs too. Plant eaters. You say, why, why the big teeth? How many of you have ever seen a bear? Right? Bears mostly eat veggies. Right? The sharp teeth help them get the nuts. and Okay. Whew. Verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. As we wrap this up, I just want to say that God's creation initially was very good. When people complain about the state of the world, and there's much to complain about in the state of the world, as Bible believers, it is important that we understand that it was not always so. It will not be this way forever, and it was not this way to start. We are living in a bubble of time right now, and there's a very good reason for this bubble of time. And that reason is patience. People are mad that the world is messed up. But the reason it's messed up is because God is very patient. It was perfect when it started, and it's going to be perfect when he's done. But in between, there's a chance for us imperfect people to get right with God. We ought to be grateful for this opportunity where you can be imperfect and still have the opportunity to get right with God. Because when it's perfect, again, that's the final state. Okay. All right. I've got very little time. <laughs> but we're going we're gonna to buckle your seatbelts. We're going to make some application here this morning. Secure, safe, and sound is the, is the theme of this series that we've been doing in Genesis. The example that I like to remind you of is just this. What if we let the cold out of the cabin? Most of you have heard this many times, so I don't want to belabor the point. We want to do it quickly this morning. When you first come in from the cold into the warmth, it is very shocking and it's very uncomfortable. It can hurt. You sweat. It seems unpleasant. The instinct can be open the windows, open the doors, turn the heat down. But it's because you are so cold that the heat seems extreme when really the heat is what you need. And if we open all the windows and we open all the doors and we make the inside just like the outside, it's more comfortable for people who are outside to come inside, but there's no difference anymore between outside and inside. And if you're freezing to death, there's nowhere now to go to get warm. We're not talking about heat and cold this morning. I'm talking about spiritual truth. I understand that the church is increasingly different from the world. I know that that's true. But if we make the church more like the world, where can they go when they want to get warm? If their burdens are finally too heavy to bear, if they're finally tired, where can they go if the church has become just like there? Christian, I know it is unpopular to be a Bible believer. I know you will increasingly face scorn and ridicule, even hatred for believing what this book says. But I want to tell you how vitally important it is that there be somewhere for the lost to go. Our, our theme hymn that we're singing this month, who'll go find the lost ones and bring them to the fold? Who'll go bring them in from the cold? Where are they going to go to come in from the cold? So as we think about keeping the church hot, as we think about keeping the church Loyal to Christ, loyal to his Bible, how are we going to do it? We're going to ask three questions through this series. We're going to make that application now. Those questions are, first of all, secure. Is it really true 
We're going to begin by saying, is it really true what this book says? Can, is it reasonable for us to actually believe that it's literally true? Secondly, how is it safe? What, what dangers does it keep it safe from? If we'll believe the Bible, what does it keep us safe from? And then thirdly, is it sound? Can we really build our lives on this? Is it a really a solid foundation for living? Can you really change the way you practice, the way you think, the way you treat other people based on what this book says? And the answer to that is all yes. Okay, let's make that application this morning. We'll start with secure. Is this really true that God made people in his image? Is it really true that God made human beings uniquely in his image? What, what is taught today in our schools and in our universities and just in culture, uh, you know, any TV show or anything that you want to look at, any mass media of any kind, they are emphatic all the time, and unnecessarily so. I mean, I don't know if you've noticed this, but, but it, it just, it bugs me now. I've reached a point where it's bugged me. I try not to be bothered by it. Where you can be talking about, listen, I just want to watch this show about volcanoes. Like, just, just tell me about the volcanoes. I don't need 10 minutes on evolution smacked into my thing on volcanoes. Like, why, why? There's a reason why. There's an agenda is why. <laughs> and the agenda is the idea that you are not special. The agenda is you are just an animal. You are a thinking, talking, upright, relatively hairless animal. And they're insistent on that. Now, I just want to say off the top, who does that sound like? If that doesn't sound like the voice of the enemy to you, to just say you're just an animal, Listen, my friend, that's the voice of the enemy. And if you can't hear that hiss through the lie that you're just an animal, then I'm glad I have the chance to warn you. But is it really true that people are fundamentally different than animals? You know, the first transplant, the first uh, heart transplant ever attempted was attempted by French doctors, and they put a pig heart into a human subject which if you don't know, is an exceedingly terrible idea. Now they did that because a pig heart structurally is actually very similar to a human heart. People have noticed for a long time that uh, certain kinds of monkeys uh, have some features similar to us. Their nose in the sort of the same place and mouths and their throat structures are pretty similar. Their hands and feet look a little bit like ours. People have noticed these sorts of similarities between people and animals for a long time. Is it really true that people are fundamentally different than animals are? I want to suggest to you this morning that it is. That the Bible says that people are different than animals. That it's not plants and animals and people are animals, but it's plants, animals, and people. That they're three distinct categories. The Bible teaches that plainly. Is it true? Three things I want to highlight this morning, and we're going to have to do it very, very quickly. The first is supernatural language. People have a supernatural ability for language. Now, again, this, it's not because we have the command of language that makes us in the image of God. It's because we're in the image of God that mostly people have language. There are exceptions, brain damage, things like that. Still in the image of God. Okay. Language is astonishingly complex and is in the image of God. God, from our very first verses, what's it say? And God said. In the beginning was the word. The word particularly is language. Language is central to who God is. Language is part of the core essential makeup of God. And so human beings' um, language is a particularly stunning reflection of the image of God. I love language. I love it. I, my poor dad wanted his son to play baseball and basketball or anything, really. Signed up to coach all of it so that, I would, so that I would play. And I brought my books and sat on the sideline and read my books while my dad... But the good news is I produced a grandson who's going to play ball with him. So... <laughs> I love language. I love it. And it's so complex. 
Um, I don't have time to do this as much as I'd like to, but I'll do it a little bit. Language is the encoding. What is language? Language is the encoding and decoding of complex word symbols. If you think about what language is, it'll blow your mind. I am vibrating my vocal cords and passing air across it. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm shaping it a little bit with my tongue and my mouth as it comes out. But that's what I'm, I'm sucking air in, blowing it past my vocal cords, and I'm making, and by doing that, I'm taking ideas, information, thoughts, and I'm encoding it into word symbols that don't mean anything. You, those sound waves are hitting your eardrum. You're decoding that code and getting the same thoughts in your head that were in mine. I, I, I'll never get over it. There, there are people that I feel like I know better than people I've actually met who have been dead for hundreds of years because I've read their books. And you spend time with these people, you get to know the way they think, and you feel like you, you know them, and you do. Why? Because you read all these things that they wrote about and thought about and said. Through time and space and distance, they put some ideas that were in their head into mine. Language is open-ended and productive, which means once you have the basics, you can make and understand sentences that have never been said before. I mean, consider this. You can't understand a word that you don't know the meaning of. But I could put words together in a way that have never been put together ever before in the history of humanity, and you could understand it without having to be taught what each individual sentence means, by just knowing some of the words, I could say sentences that have never before been said, but you can perfectly understand what I mean. All right, we'll switch to that one. If I said pink elephants dancing on top of cups while floating in the Pacific Ocean and drinking champagne, I feel like that's probably never been said before. But do you all understand what I just said? That's amazing! <laughs> I just got up here and said a whole bunch of nonsense and you all got the same picture that, you know, you can, all, you can do a blood test later if you want to, but you can all get it. I think it's incredible. Words have arbitrary meanings. Unlike animal sounds, the words, the sounds don't necessarily mean anything, right? You, if I was like, ah, or mm -hmm, or whatever, you might understand that, that those sounds have meaning. But words don't just have meaning. It's a code. You've got to understand the code or it doesn't mean anything. That's so complicated. Language has grammatical and semantic categories. We don't have time to get into all that this morning. I'm talking about things like nouns and verbs, tenses, past and present, uh, semantic categories. Really, when you start, so not only are the words complicated, but those words then can be used in different ways, in different categories, in different contexts that completely change what the word means. Some of you are not sufficiently impressed by this. Okay. <laughs> it's so complicated. You, it's like it's hard to even imagine. Because, listen, if babies don't do this by the time they're three, we haul them to the doctor because we're like, something's wrong with my kid. He's not doing this fabulously complex thing that we don't even understand, but he can't do it. I'm worried. <laughs> Language is modality independent. Uh, that's a fancy way of saying that it's, it's not based on the form that it takes. Maybe that's worse. Uh, it, language can be heard, it can be read, it can be seen, it can be touched. You can put it into braille or carve it into stone and you can feel it. Language does not get its meaning from its form. The words and ideas of language are not physical. This is really powerful if you can get it. The, the words that I'm saying to you, are they transcend the, the physical order. I, I have immaterial thoughts and ideas in my head. They're, they're not material. They can't be weighed or measured. And I'm giving them physical form by speaking them. Or I could give it physical form by writing it down or by typing it out or something. But, but that word can be spoken or said or written or it can be given any form I want to give it. Interpretive dance, maybe. <laughs> it's independent of the form. 
which means it transcends the physical order. It transcends time and space. Like I said, you can communicate with people. Language will reach back through time where we can write things down that will go into the future. It's not bound by time or the physical creation. Language is a transcendent thing. If I lost you on all that, I got something for you. Consider the word up. Would you consider the word up with me this morning? It is easy to understand up, meaning towards the sky or up towards the top of the list. But I want you to consider these things this morning. We wake up. At a meeting, topics come up. People speak up. Incumbent officers are up for election. And then it's up to the secretary to write up a report. We can call up our friends or take up with the wrong crowd. You can brighten up a room or polish up the silverware. I can warm up the leftovers after I clean up the kitchen. We lock up the house or fix up an old car. We can stir up trouble or line up for tickets. You can work up an appetite or think up excuses. To be dressed is one thing, but to be dressed up is special. Some uses of up are confusing. A drain has to be opened up because it got stopped up. <laughs> we open up a store in the morning, but then we close it up at night. When it threatens to rain, we say it's clouding up. But when the sun comes out, we say, oh good, it's clearing up. When it rains, it soaks up into the earth, and it doesn't rain for a while, things dry up. To be knowledgeable about the proper use of up, you could look up the word up in the dictionary. In a desk-sized dictionary, it takes up almost a quarter of a page and can have up to 30 definitions. If you're up to it, you could try building up a list of the way many ways up is used. It'll take up a lot of your time, but if you don't give up, you could wind up with 100 or more. I could go on and on, but I'm going to wrap up before all my time is up. Last thought. Whatever you do is, of course, up to you. But if you mess up, remember you can always look up and God will help you get back up. <laughs> oh yeah, there you go, all right. <laughs> what I'm trying to say to you this morning is language is amazing. And you can do bananas, bananas things with language because it's transcendent. All right, I'm running out of time. Language is uniquely human. Now. Do you want to try to do something with this microphone? Or? Well, the light's still on. I think the battery's working. I do like to be able to move. Round of applause for Deacon Nate. shot. Nope. All right. Language is uniquely human. Language is not something that animals do. Now, animals communicate. Animals communicate marvelously. Animals communicate wonderfully. Animals communicate in all kinds of different ways. Uh, animals communicate in visual ways. Think about peacocks. Uh, animals uh, communicate through sound. Uh, think about dolphins uh, or wolves. Um, bees do a special dance to tell other bees where the good flowers are and how far away they are. Um, some animals even use chemicals to communicate. Ants, uh, skunks uh, use different pheromones and chemicals to communicate uh, with each other. Uh, animals are unbelievable communicators, really, really wonderful. But animal communication is finite, closed, and limited. Really the opposite of what language is, right? Now we can communicate a little bit with animals, right? Dog owners are all going, yeah, and cat owners are going, but can we, though? <laughs> <laughs> we can communicate a little bit with animals. Um, our dogs, uh, we're trying with dolphins, some really cool stuff, trying to communicate with dolphins and, like, uh, talking back and forth with them. We can teach parakeets a couple of words. Um, Gorillas have been taught some sign language. Uh, Coco the gorilla, very famous, learned almost a thousand different uh, signs modified for her hands, sign language. Um, but 
But even with all that, that's a testimony to human ingenuity and human use of language, not animal. That's animal communication, but it's not animal language. Coco the gorilla, even with a thousand signs, never asked a single question. Never asked a question. Never, at, never talked about anything beyond the immediate here and now. She, she learned signs to be able to communicate back and forth. Like you take a dog, speak, roof, you know. You can teach an animal to do that, but they don't use language. Because language is something that is special to being in the image of God. And also language just defies evolution. It just defies evolution. A lot of evolutionists will actually even admit that the existence of language is an enormous problem. We'll talk more about this when we get to the Tower of Babel. Three things, and I've got to move on. Language is irreducibly complex. There's no evolutionary method to explain the development of language. It requires your tongue, your throat, your brain, your breathing control. All has to work in perfect synchronicity and with something to say, or else you can't do it. If any one part is missing, you can't do it. Look at how easily we can damage people's ability to communicate in people, and you'll begin to understand how terribly, terribly difficult it is to create a language system. It has no selection value. The whole thing that supposedly drives evolution is uh, selection, survival of the fittest. There's no survival benefits to language. Being able to say where the good food is, warn about danger, fine. But for what we're doing right now, there's no selection value for this. So it's unexplainable by evolution, which really all points to the third point, which is that it's non-material. You cannot explain a transcendent, non-material thing like language through physical processes. We're talking about something that's transcendent. There's no biological explanation for that. Okay. Quickly. Supernatural creativity. Part of being in the image of God is our supernatural creativity. We see from the very beginning, God said. In the beginning, the word. We see supernatural language. But then what did God do with his words? He created. Creativity, the urge to create, is also something that animals do not have that's uniquely human. Animals build nests. They build dens. Spiders spin incredibly fantastic, beautiful webs. But they do it the same way every single time. It varies based on what materials are available or the environment they're in, but it's the same pattern. Human beings are not that way. Think about the variety in human homes. Have you ever played that game? Would you rather live in the country estate, the beach house, the castle, or the cabin in the woods, right? We, we love to do that because the, the variety in human homes is staggering. Why? Because we like to. Because we have these, this creative impulse to just do different things. Animals sing, of course. They howl. They make noises. Birds sing but they do not write new music. They don't create art to decorate their homes or to beautify their communities. They don't put on plays or make movies for each other. You'll really enjoy it. They don't think of a new story to entertain the kids. Animals are wonderful, but, but they're not creative the way that people are. I mean, people, we create unbelievable music and art and stories. Why? Why do people create stories? Why do we build games to play? Why do we do these things? It's because we are made in the image of God. Now, if you're not a creative person, you're still in the image of God. <laughs> people are creative because they're in the image of God. It's not your creativity that makes you. And then finally, supernatural morality. Another thing that separates people from animals is Language, it's creativity, and it's morality. You'll notice that God, the Word, language, creates, and then after he creates things, what does he keep saying? Over and over and over in Genesis chapter 1, we've seen it. And God said it was good. Good is a judgment call. Good is an expression of value, relative value. I think meatball, potluck Sunday is a good Sunday. Some of you may not like meatballs, and we still love you and you're welcome to come here. <laughs> but it's a, it's, a, it's a moral, now that's a silly example, but it's a, it's a moral kind of judgment. Animals don't do this. Carnivores 
survive by eating the animals that are smaller and weaker than they are. The lions pick out the weak member of the herd, try to separate it from the herd, and then eat it. They don't hesitate from adultery or theft. The biggest and strongest take what they want, and there are no legal protections for the weak in the animal kingdom. The sick and the wounded have got to care for themselves. Right? The herd leaves the sick and the wounded behind because if they stay with them, then the whole herd's at risk. May I say this this morning? Using what is natural is a terrible guide for what is moral. I am so grieved when I see in the news and people, politicians talking about, well, it's natural. Well, so is eating anybody weaker than you. So is the strong taking whatever they want from the weak. A hundred percent natural. Are we sure we want to use what's natural as our guide for what is moral? Using what is natural leads to untold atrocities. Atrocities are natural. And human beings' ability to see that just because something is natural does not make it moral is a reflection of the fact that we are made in the image of God and that we can say it is not okay just because you can get away with it. It is not okay just because you're stronger to take what you want from the weak. It is not all right to do whatever your instincts tell you to do. And it's not okay. All right. Oh boy. All right. You get some extra preaching, no charge. Uh, this is a picture of the Supreme Court of the United States, the, the front of it. I don't know if you can read it there. It says, equal justice under law. As a country, we do not very often live up to this lofty sentiment, tragically. But it is, this sentiment is a reflection of the fact that we are in the image of God. We have an idea that we ought to be equal under the law. Equality is the opposite of natural. What could be more obvious than we are not equal? We are obviously not equal. Some are faster, some are smarter, some are stronger. But this idea that we ought to be equal, treated the same under the law, is a reflection of the image of God. It is not a natural thing. All right, let's talk about being safe here a little bit, the lie of racism. <laughs> I'm going to kill racism in five minutes here, watch me. All right. The Bible has always said that there's only one human race. We are all descendants of Adam and Eve. You all reading the same Bible I'm reading? Everybody here, descendants of Adam and Eve, and even more recently than that, we are all cousins uh, through Noah, through Noah and Mrs. Noah, right? If you just read your Bible and believe what it says, that's what you'll find. In Acts 17, the Bible says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, and he hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. God has made out of one blood all people. That is a scientific fact. Now, I know some of us are darker than others and some of us are paler than others, but we are not different colors. We hit this in our vacation Bible school really hard. This is a slide I took right from VBS. This is the slide we showed the kids at VBS. You, guess what, children? You're all shades of brown. And we changed red and yellow, black and white. They're precious in his sight. It's sh shades of... Oh, I'm going to mess it up now, Pastor Farouk. Help me. Shades of, brown, oh, shades of brown from dark to light. They are precious in his sight. I like that better. Okay, the sentiment's fine. Listen, we're, we're all in your skin color. Who cares? Some of you are more tan than others. whoop de do. The Bible says God is made of one blood, all people on the nation of the earth. Guess what? If you're in a terrible car accident today after church, please don't be, and, and you go to the hospital, they don't care what color your skin is. They might want to know if you're type O or not, or if you're A or B, right? But they don't care what skin color you're from when they're going to give you blood. The things that matter about you have nothing to do with any of that. Now, Around the time of the Enlightenment in the 1600s, people started to propose the idea that there were different races of men. It doesn't really show up until about the 1600s. 
and that the different races of men maybe had different origins. This unbiblical idea was mostly confined to so-called scientific circles until about the 1800s when Charles Darwin came along and he poured fire, he poured gasoline on this fire of racism. The idea of evolution took off. Because now they began, scientists for hundreds of years regarded racism as a biological fact. Uh, this is a diagram um, from the book uh, Types of Mankind, published in 1854. You can see here that at the top we have the Greeks, then in the middle we have the so-called Negroes, and then here we have the chimpanzees. I don't even like showing this picture. Doesn't it just make you a little bit ill? It ought to. This is terrifying. And this was regarded as scientific fact for hundreds of years, called scientific racism. Guess when it was discredited? Not until after World War II, when the full horror of dividing people into different groups and saying some races are more evolved and other races are less human, when the full just atrocity of that was no longer unavoidable is when they finally started changing the scientific textbooks. I'll put this slide back up. I don't like looking at that one. Nowadays, the idea has been thoroughly discredited. But it turns out, despite what the scientists said for hundreds of years, it turns out the Bible is right the whole time. We are all one race and all part of the same human family. Sometimes people ask about missing links. I don't really have time to do this, the missing links. I'll say this about missing links. They're missing. <laughs> Um, the Nebraska man, uh, really famous Nebraska man. Some of you probably had this picture even in your, in your textbooks as kids. Uh, Nebraska man, super famous. Uh, one of the reasons the Nebraska man is famous is the Scopes trial, where evolution was on trial in America, whether or not you could teach evolution in schools in Tennessee. They made movies about it. It's kind of famous. The, the monkey man from the Scopes trial, this is who they were talking about. They were talking about Nebraska man. That, that's, that was the missing link. That was the evidence in the Scopes trial here in the United States for why we ought to be teaching evolution as a scientific fact to our school kids. Guess what? Nebraska man, this drawing, you know what the archaeological evidence for this drawing is? One tooth. One. They drew this picture based on one tooth. And guess what we found out about 35 years later? When, when we got some genetic and DNA testing, when that stuff was just starting to come out, that tooth came from a pig. They drew this and used it in court based on a pig's tooth. Go read about it. I dare you. Piltdown man. Then later we got Piltdown man. Because most, most of the missing links, all archaeology, are based on two or three or four bones. Almost nothing. When they found Piltdown Mound, they got really excited because they had a whole skull. Never before we found a whole skull of a missing link. And so you can still go to Piltdown, England, where they dug it up, and there's monuments, and you, know, you can go to the tavern that's named after them, and the whole thing. It's a big deal. It's a tourist industry there, right? Piltdown Mound. For almost 50 years, Piltdown Mound, Exhibit A, guess what? It's a hoax. It's a hoax. The guys made it up. They finally proved it as a fraud. It took them almost 50 years where they finally proved this whole thing. It's a fraud. They just, they assembled that out of, out, of, out of other bones and glue. But listen, if you were a Christian for a long time, it was like, how, you don't believe in missing links? You backwards, anti-science, yokel hick. Look, we've got the bones for 50 years. Oh, never mind. Turns out it was a hoax. But pay no attention to that. We found new bones. We found new bones. The new bones today are Lucy. Maybe you've heard of Lucy. Have you seen the drawings of Lucy? It's, you know, she's upright and walking around and looks pretty human and stuff like that. These are, these are literally the bones that she's based on. You'll notice there's almost none of the skull, no hands, no feet. And they will tell you that Lucy walked upright, used her hands, had feet just like ours, based on zero bones. Lucy, we have 47 out of the 207 standard bones in a skeleton. 47 out of the 200, no, we have 47, there are 207 missing from the skeleton. And now, this is, for most of my life, Lucy's been exhibit A in The Missing Link, but now guess what? The new models of what Lucy looks like, looks like that. You know what that looks like to me? I mean, I know I'm an uneducated yokel hick, but that looks like a monkey, so, okay. 
racism's a lie. But if you think about evolution, that we evolved from ape-like creatures on the way up, it's not that big of a stretch to think some people are more evolved than other people. It's a dangerous idea. It's a dangerous idea to think that some people could be more human than other people. But if you believe the Bible, if you believe the Bible, you are safe from this kind of nonsense. You are safe because the Bible says God made people in his image. And if you just believe that, you are safe from all kinds of craziness. You're also safe from the destruction of hatred. People that maybe are not racist at all can fall into the trap of hating other people. 1 John 4.20, the Bible says, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Well, easy. <laughs> That's part of the problem. Part of the problem is I have seen my brother. God, have you seen my brother? What's the point? The point the Bible's making is, listen, what kind of love is it if it can't survive seeing somebody? People that say they love you and don't know you, that doesn't mean very much, does it? If somebody that doesn't know you, that just met you, say, I love you so much. Okay, calm down. When my wife says she loves me, the other day we had a little bit of a tussle. It was my fault. <laughs> I know. And we got, we got cleaned up. And uh, she said, I sure love you. And I appreciate that. Because she knows me. That's what the Bible's getting at here. Listen, if you can't love the people that are around you, don't kid yourself about how much you love God. Because if you love God, love the people that are in the image of God. When you start to see other people as not just obstacles on your way to the grocery store, and see them as people that are in God's image, it'll change the way that you treat them. Matthew 5, Jesus said, I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. I used to think that love your enemies meant be kind to your enemies. And it certainly means that. I don't know if you've ever tried to love somebody who's your enemy. It is enormously painful. It is so costly to love somebody that hates you. It is so costly. But that's what we're called to. Not even because there's anything necessarily good in that person. But we look at them, and in that person, we see an image bearer of the God who loves us. And if when you start to see the image of God in those other people, it starts to make it really hard to hate them. Hatred is like drinking poison and hoping the other person gets sick. Hatred will poison you. Hatred will kill you. Christian, there are times when it's appropriate for the Christian to get angry. There are times when it's appropriate for the Christian to stand up and say, that's not right. But there's never cause to hate. It's never right. And you'll be safer from that if you can see the image of God in every other person. If you believe what the Bible says, you'll be a little bit safer from hatred. And then finally, we're closing here. Sound. Can we really build our lives on this truth? And I would suggest to you that we can. You can build it, number one, because every human is precious. Everybody is. From the biggest ones to the littlest ones. 
and the ones that the world says are, are important to the little girls that are living in cardboard. Their fathers have assembled on top of a dump heap in the Philippine Islands. Everyone is precious. In John 3.16, you say, how precious are they? The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God thinks everyone is worth dying for. I don't know if you have ever thought about that, but God thinks that you are worth dying for. And not in the sense of like, hey, I'd die for you, man. But like he actually did. Ephesians 4, 31, the Bible says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger, and clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Sometimes when you really get down to it with people, and I've been down there, and you probably have too. So I don't, I don't know if I can forgive this person. I don't know if I can be kind to them. For starters, they're not sorry. Do you know there's no escape hatch here for if the person's not sorry? <laughs> the Bible says, put it away from you. Forgive them the same way God forgave you. Are you glad that God does not withhold his forgiveness based on us being bad? We need his forgiveness because we are bad. <laughs> and the Bible says the same way God forgave you, you go forgive other people that way. Go forgive them. It's a solid foundation for living. Why? Because you, when you do that, you are being kind and gracious and forgiving to people that are image bearers of the living God. I like people that are nice to my kid. A lot of people look right past Evangeline. We take her out in public and it's always a little bit of a bummer. You know, people with special needs kids, you know, it's, it's not all bad. Some of them, they don't, they don't know what to do. They don't know what they're supposed to do. You know, so they're, they're uncomfortable. I don't, and so they just, Sometimes we'll go do something and they'll have a sucker and they'll give one to Hugo and not offer one to Evangeline. But then you get those people who, you know, just treat her like she's a person. <laughs> and I always kind of get a charge out of that. Because she's really precious. I mean, she's a special needs kid. But I learned a little secret a few years ago. Every person I've ever met is special needs. I'm a special needs pastor. And I like it when people treat me like a person. We just started believing that every person was precious and every person mattered. Every person had something to contribute, even if they're a little different than we are. I think, I think the Lord would like that. This father likes it when people treat his kids, even though they're a little broken, even though they're not maybe the same as everybody else. Somebody treats them good, kind to them, sweet to them. I like that. I think God likes it too. And then finally, and we're closing here. You were designed for fellowship with God. You were designed for fellowship with God. Why the image of God? Talked a lot about this morning, and, and I want to try to end on this note here. Being in the image of God is wonderful and special and unique and powerful, and I hope that you believe what the Bible says, that it's true, that you're not just an animal, that you're not just a really uppity monkey, But why? Why make people? 
Why make people in his own image? Why would God do that? Was God lonely? Was God incomplete somehow? Why do it? You were made for fellowship. God looked at Adam and said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a help meet for him. I believe God's telling us something about himself in that. God wanted a companion. God wanted fellowship. He wanted the bride of Christ. He wanted you to be close to him. Ephesians 2.13, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes far off, are made nigh. You're made close. You're made near by the blood of Christ. Jesus died so that you could have fellowship with him. You ever died so that you could fellowship with somebody? <laughs> Hebrews 10.22 says, what's the reaction to that? Let us, therefore, draw near. Let us draw near. God has gone so far so that you could have fellowship with him. How much do you want to have fellowship with God? Tyler Gillett, one of my favorite preachers, said this, the land without the Lord is just dirt. This is one of the key insights that Moses had on the way to the promised land. When God said, I'll just give you the promised land, but I'm not going with you. It's one of the most amazing passages in Scripture. Moses says back to God, he says, God, if you're not going, I'm not going. God, I don't want the promised land without you. Because Moses understood this key truth, that the, Lord, that the land without the Lord, it's just dirt. I don't know what it is that you are looking for in your life this morning. But I'd ask you this, how badly do you want to know God? And maybe you could consider this morning how badly God wanted to know you. Every head bow and eyed closed in the arena if you're able to come and play. And I, I know I'm a little bit past time. The meatballs will keep, I promise. Before we're dismissed and before we go, I want to invite you to spend just a couple minutes now and just do a little bit of business with God. We're not going to have an altar call. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to do anything like that. But I would like to ask you, if, if I could, please, Take a moment of quietness with you and God. What did God want to talk to you about? I, I, I covered a lot of territory. I said a lot of things. But none of, none of the things that I said will change your life at all. Probably even make a difference. If there's going to be a difference made, if something's going to happen in your life, if some heavy burden is going to get lighter, if something that's confusing is going to get clear, it's going to have to be because God had something to say to you. And I'm telling you this morning that you were made in the image of God for fellowship with Him. God wants to have fellowship with you. He wants to know you and you to know Him. If you want God to speak to you, I am telling you He will. He died on an old rugged cross so that he could. Not because you're good. He knew that you weren't, which is why he went so far to rescue you. What's the Lord want to say to you this morning? Is God talking to you about the security of his word? Maybe you're one of those that's been rattled about, can you really trust what the Bible says? God would speak to you about that this morning. Maybe it's about the safety of avoiding some of these traps. I don't know if you fall into the trap of thinking some people are more human and others are less human than others. Maybe God would speak to your heart about that. You say, God, I need your help to see your image in every person. You fall into the trap of hating somebody. Hatred's poison. Say, God, would you 
God, I can't think of a single good thing about this person. But they are in your image. Would you help me to see that so that I could be kind, that I could forgive them, that I could let this hatred go? Maybe God's calling you forward in something about fellowship with him. Listen, if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, you, you, you believe in God or you know about Jesus, but you're not sure of all the details of that, listen, I, I'd tell you this. The first step in fellowship with God is accepting his forgiveness, of understanding that you're broken, but that God loves you. And that anyone who wants to can come. Listen, we'll take a Bible and we'll show you right from the Bible, not the church's opinion, not the Baptist opinion. We'll show you right from the Bible how you can know for sure that Jesus Christ is your Savior. Again, I'm not going to ask you to come forward or raise your hand or do anything, but listen, if that's you, would you get a hold of somebody after service? If you are saved here this morning, you know that heaven's your home, Jesus is your Savior. Maybe you're out of fellowship with him, though. You've let something else push God to the margins. So folks are getting the land. Somehow you lost sight of getting the Lord. And you'd say this morning, God, you made me in your image for fellowship with you and I need to get back to that time, that fellowship with you. Listen, how are God speaking to you? We're going to sing in just a moment. Before we do, you do business with God, whatever he's talking to you about.